So good evening. Um, my name is Jeff Jaguer. I'm your host for the Cancer Prevention and Wellness Series um, uh, produced by the Cancer Survivors Park Alliance. Um, a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, the audience will be muted throughout this. Uh, we do not want that to imply that we are discouraging uh, interaction or questions. Um, but any questions um, that you have uh, can be presented through the chat uh, feature of, of the Zoom, and we'll be monitoring those. So we encourage you to have uh, more of an interactive se session. Um, our session tonight will be uh, recorded, and in a few days, this will be on our um, cancersurvivorspark.org website. And, um, if you um, feel like there's some take home messages for people that you know, um, please uh, offer that option to them as a, a way to, uh, to click on that link and, um, and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, review this, this lecture uh, in, at your leisure. Um, so I think those are the major uh, housekeeping things, again, recorded, and um, we encourage you to use the chat feature. Uh, tonight, uh, we have with us uh, Tanya uh, Carter, who is a licensed uh, medical social worker with the Prisma Health uh, Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship. Um, and she's gonna talk on a very important subject. Um, you know, when, when any of us, uh, when, when we get that diagnosis, um, and it could be a cancer diagnosis or any kind of uh, a significant diagnosis, uh, not only is the, the person with the diagnosis affected, but their family uh, members uh, are, and there's usually one that has to be taking the role of the caregiver, and that implies uh, that their life changes, um, their, their job may change, they may not be able to continue their job, their financial changes, the financial situation changes, they may have to move. I mean, there's lots of things that caregivers uh, for our patients have to go through. And um, so that's another whole uh, aspect of this journey, um, that there are more involved than just the care uh, just the the patient and the care team, um, but the the family that that's there to take care of the patient, and we have to take care of that caregiver. Um, so, Tanya, we're really looking forward to your remarks. And uh, without further ado, I will um, hand the mic over to you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jaguer. I'm excited to be here tonight with all of you, and I appreciate you all taking time out um, from your, your busy schedules and busy evenings um, to spend some time with us tonight talking about um, how we can um, provide care and support for caregivers. So without further ado, we will get into um, our presentation. So a little bit about me. Um, I have been a social worker for the last 25, 27 years. Um, my previous work includes um, long-term care, um, working with military service members, veterans, and their families with the American Red Cross and their service to armed forces program. And then most recently, um, prior to coming on board with the Cancer Institute, um, I worked for the Alzheimer's Association, providing support for caregivers of those, um, caring for those with Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, in 2021, I stepped away from work to care for my father full-time who had um, been diagnosed with um, lung cancer. Um, and I joined Prisma Health Cancer Institute in October of 2021. So I've just passed um, the one year mark um, and am, you know, excited to be on board with the Cancer Institute um, in working with to support patients and, and families as they move through the cancer experience. All right, so this quote that you see on the screen, um, there are only four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. 
um, by Rosalind Carter. Um, she started the Caregiver Institute in the mid 80s. Um, and this quote really speaks to the universal nature of caregiving in that at some point in all of our lives, um, caregiving will um, touch us in some way or another. So I think that's, you know, really um, a good way to set the tone for what we'll be talking about tonight. So to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about tonight, we'll be looking at how the process of becoming a caregiver and a lot of the emotions that go along with that. Um, who cancer caregivers are, some of the common worries and concerns, um, taking on the role and adjusting to the new normal. Um, we're going to look at signs of caregiver stress and burnout and some different strategies that you can use to take care of your mind, body, and spirit as you move through your caregiver journey. And then we'll have a section where I'll share some very practical resources, some local and national resources to support you on your caregiver journey. And then we'll have time for some questions and discussion as well. So my hope as we move through today's um, program is that you will gain a greater understanding of the caregiver experience and that if you are a caregiver that you will feel acknowledged, valued and understood. Um, and so I want us to first take a look at where we're coming from when we first take on um, a cancer caregiving role. So we need to look at the emotions around a diagnosis. And many of the emotions that you see here on the screen, sadness, fear, anxiety, overwhelm, anger, guilt, blame, frustration, distress, um, loss of control, grief over loss of good health, uncertainty about the future, um, and worry about how a diagnosis will affect relationships. All of these emotions are what we typically think of as negative emotions. And the thing to understand is that all of these emotions are normal. Um, they're a normal reaction to a very difficult experience that you and your loved one are embarking on. Um, many caregivers do characterize um, the time of diagnosis and, you know, beginning of treatment and supporting their loved one as a roller coaster. Um, the one thing to understand about all of these emotions, and if you're a caregiver, you know, you, you're living this, is that, you know, you may have good days and bad days, you know, days where you feel like you have a handle on you know, some of these emotions and then other days where they are, you know, front and center. It's not a linear thing where it's, a, you know, one and done and you move through these emotions. Um, they can, you know, come up at, at any time during um, your loved one's cancer experience and your caregiving journey. And just know that that it is, it's okay to experience these emotions and to acknowledge and understand that these are a very you know, real part of the, the caregiving journey. So who are caregivers? Um, this, these statistics came from a report from the National Alliance for Caregiving um, a few years ago. Um, so cancer caregivers, 58% tend to be women. 60% have less than a college degree. The average age is 53 years old. 88% provide care to a relative. 60% provide care to someone age 65 or older, and 52% are employed, okay? So that speaks again to what Dr. Jaguer said, that a lot of times caregivers are coming to this with other roles and obligations that, you know, they're fulfilling in their life. So with 52% employed, you can imagine the impact that that has, um, you know, on a person's daily life if they're also adding in a caregiving role. You know, and, and we uh -huh. talked, Tanya, about the fact that um, I thought the, the uh, amount of women that would be the caregivers mm -hmm. would be, you know, a more significant percentage than more than half at, at 58%. Mm -hmm. But in my experience as an oncologist, um, there were a lot of times where um, the, um, the men were the caregivers, and mm -hmm. um, I, I have to give them their props. They did, they did a really excellent job. Um, so, uh, guys out there, uh, good work and, uh, you are more than capable. Yep. And I think sometimes, you know, in that situation, and we'll talk about some of the role reversal in a, in a few moments, but, 
Um, sometimes caregiving comes more naturally, you know, in certain um, segments and, and it, be, you know, it's more difficult to take on that role um, sometimes for um, male caregivers who typically haven't been in that type of caregiver role previously. All right, so this information here, some of the common worries um, that caregiver, cancer caregivers have came from a survey that was done um, through the cancer support community, their cancer experience registry. Um, and the main worries that um, caregivers had was that they were thrust into the role unexpectedly or with very little preparation. Um, Oftentimes, they felt that they were performing caregiver tasks alone and had very little, if any, support. Um, it called to mind a lot of fear of losing someone that they loved. So really confronting issues of, you know, mortality, both, you know, their loved ones and then their own. Um, and then juggling caregiving duties with other daily activities like work that we mentioned before or parenting or other social obligations that that they may have. And then most felt feelings of inadequacy when taking on a caregiver role. This next slide shows you the top 10 concerns among caregiver participants in the cancer experience registry. So you can see here that, you know, number one was a recurrence of the, the cancer, um, worrying about what lies ahead, um, looking at the patient's pain, physical discomfort, the patient's eating and nutrition, um, changes in the patient's mood or behavior. And then the next, um, the next three um, concerns really spoke to the caregivers themselves. So, you know, as a caregiver, being able to exercise and stay physically active, um, being able to eat right and get adequate nutrition was a concern. Um, and then balancing caregiving with those other demands um, that they had. They also um, were concerned about patient sleep problems and then keeping up with their own healthcare needs. So this next slide, um, this was actually compiled during a caregiver workshop that I did last fall, fall of 2021. And these were many of the roles and tasks that the caregivers who were part of that um, workshop came up with. Um, so you'll see on here um, a lot of different roles. I mean, and certainly this is not an exhaustive list. There may be other roles, but these were, were the roles that those particular caregivers um, jotted down that they were performing, um, you know, in their role as a caregiver. So um, providing hands-on care um, to their loved one, companionship, you know, providing scheduling for appointments, transporting them to appointments, um, dealing with legal and financial matters, um, becoming a much bigger part of housekeeping and other household tasks, um, you know, being a problem solver and trying to put out fires, you know, where they could, um, just coordinating um, all of the different appointments and um, visits that their loved one had. Um, becoming a communicator for their loved one um, or a scribe at medical appointments, um, making sure that they're the, the other ears who are hearing the information and, you know, writing down and keeping notes um, so that, you know, once they got home, they, you know, could kind of dive into what, you know, was shared with them. Um, medication management, dietary management, um, part of the cancer care team. And then you have um, all of the other roles that a caregiver may um, also be, partner, worker, spouse, parent, child, family member, friend. Um, so this is a big job, a big task when you take on caregiving. Um, and, you know, many times, um, you know, there may be um, things that evolve over time. So your caregiving journey may be, you know, something that evolves as the person progresses through treatment. Um, and if they have any complications or, you know, side effects from treatment, um, that may change the nature of your caregiving role, you know, as you, you know, move through time. 
So a, a few other statistics from the Cancer Experience Registry. So 98% of caregivers provided emotional support for their loved one. 96% went with their loved one to medical appointments. 82% helped with decision-making. 79% coordinated medical care. 80% provided transportation. And 74% helped manage finances. So let's look a little bit at some of the relationship changes and role shifts that can happen as you move throughout your caregiving journey. Um, in our everyday lives, under ordinary circumstances, there's a dynamic within these relationships that we see here that we grow accustomed to staying relatively the same and relatively stable over time. But as you take on a caregiving role, you may find yourself involved in your loved one's life in a very different way or in ways that you previously have not been. Um, the cancer experience may throw off the balance of some of these relationships. Um, and some examples of this can be seen in um, a caregiving spouse or a partner who has to take on additional tasks or roles at home. Um, whether it's, you know, things that have predominantly been, you know, carried out by the patient, you know, for instance, household chores or outside household tasks, um, cooking, um, financial matters, other decision making, child care, those types of things. So you may see, you know, the caregiver having to take on more and more of those responsibilities. Um, and as we saw earlier, 60% of caregivers are providing care to someone 65 or older. And oftentimes this is an adult child caring for a parent. Um, so you may see situations where adult children are having to take on more of a decision-making role in their parents' care or be involved in aspects of their parents' lives where they previously had, had not been, um, such as finances. Um, I know this was the case, um, you know, in my caring for my dad. Um, you know, there were aspects of his life that, you know, I was not privy to before. And then when I took on a caregiving role, I suddenly was thrust into um, a lot of, of wearing a lot of different hats um, caring for him. And in family situations where there are multiple children or siblings, you may see one sibling stepping up to take more of a primary role in caregiving. Um, and, you know, there could be um, differing opinions about what is needed for the care of the loved one. Um, so, you know, you may have conflict within sibling relationships um, in that circumstance. Um, caregivers may also have a partner, a spouse, children, or a job that is impacted by their responsibility of caregiving. Um, caregiving may impact your ability to maintain contact with friends and other social relationships that previously had provided a lot of nurturing and support for you, and you just simply don't have time um, to keep up with those. Um, it may have an impact on your coworkers if you're having to, you know, miss work a lot or you're not able to meet deadlines or, you know, projects at work. Um, you could see that your coworkers are being affected um, by that as well. And all of this is, is very tough. All of these changes are extremely difficult to navigate um, as these different, you know, relationship um, role shifts happen and these relationships change. So it's very common to feel, you know, confused and stressed um, as you start to see those types of, of shifts starting to happen. So adjusting to the new normal um, and those changing roles. So just some, some pointers here is to decide what's important and what might need to be put aside for a while. Okay, um, we all have to be very realistic and flexible when we're taking on a caregiving role about what um, is, is worth our time um, to tend to, um, you know, and to focus on, you know, what's really important in the moment. Um, sharing how you're feeling and allowing time for listening, um, you know, sharing how you're feeling with the patient with your loved one um, and being open and honest, um, <clears throat> you know, can, can go a long way to helping, you know, maintain those lines of communication. 
um, letting your loved one know you're available, but letting them decide when they need help. Um, I think there's a tendency, you know, for, for caregivers to want to be everything and do everything um, for their loved one. And, you know, they, you might come up against resistance um, to that. And you'll also exhaust yourself if you're trying to be everything and do everything. Um, so, you know, letting them know you're available, letting them do what they're able to do and capable of doing for as long as, as they are able. Um, taking cues from the person that you're caring for and respecting um, their need to, to either share or to be quiet. Um, people deal with, you know, their internal thoughts and feelings in different ways. And, you know, they may not want to share, um, you know, all of what they're, you know, thinking or feeling, or it may not be the right time. So just, you know, taking your cues, you know, from, from the individual. Being realistic and flexible um, and knowing your limitations, um, you know, not trying to do it all yourself. Okay. And then finally, respecting the need to be alone, both for the person that you're caring for and for you um, and making sure that, you know, you are having those times when you're respecting that, um, that alone time that you both need. Um, let me go back. I had one more point I wanted to make on that um, particular slide. So there was actually a study done looking at um, caregiver experiences and this, this adjusting to the new normal um, and trying to keep life as normal as possible. And um, what they found in that study, it was a study of caregiver experiences, was that um, caregivers did identify that trying to keep life as normal as possible was important to them. Um, and they, they really discerned three different um, strategies um, to help do this. So living life one day at a time and taking things, you know, as they came, you know, and not trying to, to get too far ahead um, in their thinking was, was very helpful. Um, trying to rebalance life at every step of the way. So balancing their needs with the needs of their loved one, you know, and, and trying to keep the focus that, you know, that they were an integral part of the cancer experience and they needed to tend to their own needs as well as the needs of, of the patient. And then, you know, realizing the need to get out of the situation temporarily if they needed to. Um, so taking those necessary times away and that respite, um, so that, you know, they could come back um, <clears throat> rejuvenated and recharged. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes. So some signs of caregiver stress and burnout. So what we tend to see um, when people are really experiencing the burdens of caregiving, we tend to see a lot of fatigue, um, weaker immune system, sleep problems, slower healing of wounds, um, higher blood pressure, changes in appetite or weight, headaches or other aches and pains. Um, and then finally, um, you can see anxiety, depression, and, and other mood changes that start to happen. The natural response of most caregivers is to put their own feelings and needs aside um, you know, they try to focus on the person with cancer and the many tasks of caregiving. Um, and this is fine for, you know, a short time, but over the long term, it can really be, you know, detrimental and you can really start to, you know, feel the burden of the stress. Um, if you don't take care of yourself, um, you won't be able to take care of anyone else. It's the proverbial put your oxygen mask on first, um, right. you know, so that, you know, you take care of yourself first so that you can then take care of others. Um, there's another adage that you can't pour from an empty cup. Okay. So if you're running on empty, you don't have very much to give. Okay. So you really do need to be tending to um, yourself. So how do we do that? So the next part of the presentation, we want to look at strategies that you can use to nurture um, yourself, your mind, body, and spirit, All right? 
So let's first look at some self-care strategies. So, and we'll go through each one of these. Um, it is important to take breaks when you need them. Um, this could be something as simple as, you know, 15, 30 <coughs> minutes, um, being able to take a, a break for a walk or to watch a TV program. Um, or it could mean lunch away with friends or a day away with friends. Um, this is an important you know, time for you to step away from caregiving um, responsibilities. And this might mean asking for help. If you need to, you know, have someone else come in to stay with your loved one or, you know, finding respite care um, for your loved one. Um, accepting yourself, um, acknowledging and accepting that what you're going through is difficult, that caregiving is one of the, you know, hardest jobs um, that, that you will embark upon. Um, accepting that there are aspects of caregiving that you may need help with. Um, again, many caregivers feel the need to do it all, um, but accepting that you have limitations and that this is a normal, um, it's a normal way to show compassion to yourself that you accept that, you know, you do have limitations um, and you're looking for ways to, to, you know, build your support team. Um, write it down. This can be a helpful practice to identify what you're feeling or what you might be, what might be stressing you out. Um, it can also be a time to brainstorm options for help or other ways to do things differently. Um, so for some people, this is a very helpful tool to really think through some of the challenges um, that you might be experiencing. Um, coping with negative emotions, um, dealing with things like anger and frustration, impatience, resentment, um, those can be difficult. Those are not emotions that we typically, you know, um, like to, to deal with head on. Um, the first step is acknowledging how you're feeling and finding a helpful outlet for these emotions. Um, and this can include, you know, talking to someone, whether it's a trusted friend or a counselor or even your loved one um, to let them know, you know, what it is that you're feeling. Um, and then quality time. So carving out some space to spend some time with your loved one or other family and friends doing some focused activities that are not centered around the cancer experience um, can be helpful. Um, this could be finding time to spend alone in solitary pursuits, um, like reading or gardening, for instance, or, you know, it could be time to, you know, spend with, like I said, family or friends, um, but making sure that you're carving out, you know, some of that quality time that's not focused on the cancer. Um, focusing on the positive. Um, not all aspects of the caregiving journey will be negative. Um, taking pride in the things that you feel good about, um, that you feel that you're doing well and that you feel that you have accomplished um, and really giving yourself credit um, for those things. Looking for ways that other people have stepped up and stepped in to help you and practicing some gratitude um, for that can be helpful. Um, finding small moments in your day um, that bring you joy such as, you know, a beautiful day or beautiful weather, um, laughing about something funny or listening to a favorite song. Um, so it can be small things that, you know, are interspersed um, throughout your day as well. And then making a personal declaration. Um, this could be something as simple as um, I'm doing the best I can. Or I can accept that there are things that I may not know how to do but I'll be proactive in finding help. Um, it could be something like I'm open to learning and trying new ways to cope with what I'm feeling. All right. So having some, some declarations like that that are really supportive of your self-care are important. Okay. I know for me personally, when I was caring for my dad, um, I had to, you know, make those statements to myself that I was doing the best I could and, you know, that I was going to be proactive in finding help um, when I needed it. And then finally, learning to relax. So this one gets its own slide. All right. So um, understanding that we are all unique 
people and different in, in many ways and different in the ways that we might find relaxing. Um, so this slide gives you some different activities that may help you unplug and recharge. All right. So things like aromatherapy, spending time in nature, art therapy, reading, um, visualization, yoga, taking a walk, music, breath work. Um, and, and I'm going to give you some options on, you know, how you can connect with some of these activities later in the resource section. Um, getting a massage, um, meditation, watching a, a movie, um, soaking in a warm bath, laughter, or having a warm drink. So these are just some, some ideas of things that you could do to add some relaxation um, into, um, back into your life if you're missing that. Um, and then how can you take care of your body? Um, remember, we're talking about mind, body, spirit in this section. So um, making sure that you are maintaining a healthy eating program. Um, and the first thing is to make sure that you are actually eating. Um, because oftentimes, you know, in the, the role of a caregiver, you may find that things, simple things like, you know, eating um, your own meals may, you know, come secondary to making sure that, you know, your loved one is, is taken care of. Um, skipping meals can be an easy habit to fall into um, when you're caregiving. Um, next, striving to make um, healthier choices. So opting for whole real foods, um, steering clear of processed, packaged, convenience, or fast foods as much as possible. Um, the, those choices can sometimes be a go-to when you're under stress or you're limited on time, but it's important to plan ahead and you know, try to make you know, healthier choices um, for, your, for your eating. Um, movement, exercise, and stretching can be helpful ways to de-stress and deal with some of the negative emotions that we've talked about already. Um, staying active can also help alleviate some of the aches and pains that we talked about um, before um, that are sometimes a symptom of caregiver stress. One of my favorite sayings is motion is lotion for your joints. Um, so the more active you are, the more you can, you know, keep your, your joints um, lubricated. Um, finally, this can be a way to unplug and step away from your caregiving um, to focus on yourself. Um, current um, guidelines recommend that adults need 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. Um, and two days of muscle strengthening activity each week. Um, and that may sound like a lot, but you don't have to do it all at once. Um, it can be cumulative and it can, you know, add up um, throughout the week. Um, <clears throat> next, looking at getting better quality sleep. So there's a, there's a concept called sleep hygiene, which is, is really important. And it really speaks to, um, kind of the, the getting yourself ready for bed and the habits that you get into prior to, you know, going to sleep. So aiming for consistency with your bedtime, um, making sure that, you know, you have a quiet, dark room that's at a comfortable temperature can help aid in, in good sleep. Limiting the use of electronic devices at least 30 minutes, if not longer, um, prior to going to bed. Um, this includes TV, computer, smartphone, um, avoiding heavy meals, caffeine or alcohol before going to bed. And then, you know, going back to exercise, um, being physically active during the day can also set you up for better quality sleep um, and the ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, you know, that can certainly make that, that aspect better. Um, and then finally, don't neglect your own health. So make sure that you are keeping up with all of your own health appointments, your routine screenings and needed medications. Um, so that's, that's really an important point. If something's bothering you physically, don't put off having it checked out. Okay. Um, oftentimes that is something that caregivers, um, you know, your, your health needs sometimes become, you know, a secondary priority, um, 
to your loved ones. So now we're going to talk about um, how you can nurture your spirit. So spirituality means the way that you look at the world and how you make sense of your place in it. Spirituality can include faith or religion, beliefs, values, and reasons for being. Okay. And being spiritual is a very per deeply personal issue. Um, for people and everyone, you know, has their own beliefs or practices. Um, some people find um, being spiritual through religion or their faith tradition. Some find it through practicing certain rituals or meditation and yoga. Some find a connection to their spiritual side by doing good works and volunteering to help others. And coincidentally, um, you know, if we look at some of the positive aspects of caregiving, um, that is, you know, a lot of people do find spiritual meaning and a deeper meaning in their caregiving um, because it's their way to give back to someone and to care for someone that they that they love. So they do find a deeper meaning and perhaps a connection to um, whatever their spiritual um, um, nature tends to be. Um, some people find um, spirituality through teaching or reading or writing, um, and some find it being in nature or with animals. So the cancer experience can certainly um, call to mind um, a deeper searching, you know, for meaning. Um, it can find both patients and caregivers questioning why cancer has come into your lives um, and, and really looking at some of the deeper meanings of, of, of why and really questioning why. Um, longing for the way that things used to be, um, you know, and, and looking you know, backward at, you know, a time of good health and, you know, really searching for, you know, the meaning um, in what's happening, you know, in the present. It may have people, you know, experiencing fears about what the future holds um, and questioning mortality, um, both you know, their loved ones and, you know, their own and really coming to um, a deeper um, sense of what the meaning of life is. Um, for some, it can help prioritize what it is that you value most in life. Um, if, if perhaps pri previously you weren't, you know, completely clear on that, it can help you to kind of prioritize and, and, and think about what matters most to you. Um, and for some, it can, you know, be a turning toward your faith or your spirituality, or it can see, you know, some folks turning away from it. Um, so again, everybody, you know, is unique and different in their perspective um, and their life experiences. And so may experience, um, you know, this aspect of the cancer, cancer journey um, very differently. So it may be important um, to find help and support in, in diving deeper and examining some of these issues um, that may be weighing on your mind. Um, so let's talk about how you can do that. Um, so there are some, some ways here on the screen that may be helpful to you as you're, you're moving through some of those deeper spiritual issues and questioning, you know, the, the why is this happening? And, and as you're, you know, looking at your fears about the future. Um, so reading or listening to uplifting materials, um, going to religious or spiritual services may be helpful. Um, praying or meditating, um, talking with a priest, a pastor, or another spiritual leader may be helpful. Um, looking at websites, books, or brochures for people who are dealing with cancer or connecting with um, other caregivers. And, and I wanted to leave that one for last because I think that's 
you know, extremely important is to get connected with other caregivers who are on the journey as well. Again, no two cancer patients and no two cancer caregivers are on the exact same journey, but it is helpful to connect with people who get it, who understand, you know, what you're going through and understand a lot of those common worries and concerns that you have. So um, that's an important aspect um, in finding support. So let's talk a little bit about acting with intention, because I remember at the beginning of the, the program, I, uh, my hope is that you would find, you know, one or two or, you know, a few things that you could um, utilize, some strategies that you could utilize to um, deal with any stress, worry, anxiety that you might be feeling. Um, so acting with intention, um, what is something that I used to like to do. So asking yourself that, is there something that, you know, maybe has fallen away from your life, um, you know, as you've gotten, you know, further into your caregiving journey? Um, and can you incorporate that back into your life? Okay. Um, I'll just use an example. Um, for myself, for me, it was exercise. Um, that was something that I used to love to do. I did it on a regular basis. And, you know, during the course of, you know, caring for my dad for, you know, the um, about a year that I cared for him, um, that slowly fell, you know, by the wayside. And, um, you know, I'm still, you know, trying to incorporate that, you know, back into my life. And, you know, I wish at the time that I had, you know, thought about it and thought about how I might need to do that differently and maybe ask for help, um, you know, someone to maybe stay with him so that I could focus on that aspect of my own health. Um, what things might get in the way of you, you know, bringing back, you know, one of those or two of those activities that you, you know, might want to do and kind of thinking about how you would work around those particular obstacles and then making a plan um, to, um, you know, move forward and move into action and, and actually bringing that back into your life. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about support resources. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to share a lot of information with you. So the first I want to share is the cancer support community. Um, and you'll see the, the web address there on the screen, cancersupportcommunity.org. Um, they do have a national um, organization. And then we do have a local affiliate here um, in the upstate um, that, that's um, housed through Prisma Health. Um, and at the cancer support community, this is a screenshot of their website. Um, they do have a lot of virtual programs that you can participate in. Um, and I did want to um, just show you a snapshot there of their Mind Body Studio. Um, which has a lot of videos that lead you through some guided meditations and some breath work um, that can really help to, um, you know, nurture that, that side and to help you relax. So um, that's a great resource. They also have a lot of educational um, programs as well. They have their Frankly Speaking program. Um, so there's, there's a lot packed into their website. So I highly recommend um, taking a look at it. And again, it's cancersupportcommunity.org. And then the local cancer support community um, affiliate um, housed through Prisma Health, again, um, does offer a monthly calendar actually it's not monthly anymore, it's quarterly, um, calendar of events. So you'll see here on the screen, a snapshot of October through December um, calendar. Um, and that is um, on our website, um, <clears throat> prismahealth.org, cancer support community calendar. Um, and you can pull that up, but we have a whole host of different activities from healthy living classes, movement, nutrition, arts, music. Um, we have support groups. Um, we have, you know, just a lot of different ways that we're supporting both patients and caregivers. So <clears throat> do encourage you to take a look at 
at that calendar. And then we also offer through the cancer support community and the Cancer Institute at Prisma, a caregiver's toolkit, um, which is a booklet um, that will take you through a lot of um, considerations and resources that you might need as a, a caregiver. So um, that is certainly available to anyone who, who may need that. And then I run a caregiver cornerstones um, virtual support group um, twice a month, the first Monday at 630 and the third Friday at noon. That is a virtual support group, um, but it is a time for caregivers to come together and get connected with one another. Um, so I invite any of you, you know, on the talk tonight or those who, you know, watch the recording later to um, reach out. You'll see the contact information there at the bottom of the screen. And um, you can either reach out to myself or to Rachel Ziegler, who's our community outreach coordinator. Um, and we'll be happy to get you connected um, to that, that support group. And then I also wanted to give a shout out to the Cancer Survivors Park, um, and this is a screenshot of their website, um, which is is chock full of, of different information. Um, and I've I've done a, a highlight there of the programs tab, which um, goes through the different healing stations that are available, um, survivor stories, virtual programs um, such as these, which are recorded. Um, and on the website for later viewing. Um, and then the Cancer Connection Calendar, which um, has a whole host of, of activities um, for um, both patients and, and caregivers as well. Is there anything you wanna say in addition on that, Dr. Chigar? No, no, I appreciate the plug. Um, you know, it is um, an area um, you have, commented and emphasized uh, getting out and getting away mm -hmm. and getting into nature and mm -hmm. uh, nature is very healing. Um, you know, we are on the Swamp Rabbit Trail. A lot of people just run and walk and bike through, but mm -hmm. for the patients who are going through this journey and their, their caregivers and their family, this is a place for them to come and visit um, we have tried to make it uh, somewhat of a museum uh, from the standpoint of having some exhibits. Uh, there's various healing stations. Uh, we have videos there. So uh, Tanya has mentioned faith and um, you know prayer, but there's also exercise. There's teamwork. Uh, she mentioned laughter. Um, you know there. There's lots of ways where we're not only healing the patient, but but healing their support system as well. So, you know, thank you for for mentioning us. But but um, you know, when you get a diagnosis, you get you know therapy, you get a care plan. Uh, but this is some place where we take care of all of you uh, holistically. Uh, and so it's 52 Cleveland Street. That's where the parking lot is, and then you enter nature, where it's the star. Yeah. Thanks, Tanya. Beautiful. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Okay. And then um, here are some online caregiver resources just to connect you some additional to some additional information that that may be helpful to you. So um, leave that up on the screen for for just a moment um, if folks are interested in in any of those resources. Okay. And then um, I would be remiss if I did not share um, the Caregiver Bill of Rights with all of you. Um, I do encourage you to um, take a look at this. Um, this was a document that was developed um, back in 1985, and it really speaks to um, what caregivers should be able to expect as part of the caregiver journey. So I'm gonna read through these really quickly if you don't mind. Um, so as a caregiver, I have the right to take care of myself. This is not an act of selfishness. It will give me the capability to take better care of my loved one. I have the right to seek help from others even though my loved one may object. I recognize the limits of my own endurance and strength. I have the right to maintain facets of my own life that do not include the person I care for, just as I would if he or she were healthy. I have the right to know that I do everything that I reasonably can for this person, and I have the right to do some things just for myself. 
I have the right to get angry, be depressed, and express other difficult feelings occasionally. I have the right to reject any attempts by my loved one, either conscious or unconscious, to manipulate me through guilt or depression. I have the right to receive consideration, affection, forgiveness, and acceptance from my loved one for what I do for as long as I offer these qualities in return. I have the right to take pride in what I'm accomplishing and to applaud the courage it has sometimes taken to meet the needs of my loved one. I have the right to protect my individuality and the right to make a life for myself that will sustain me in the time when my loved one no longer needs my full-time help. And finally, I have the right to expect and demand that as new strides are made in finding resources to aid physically and mentally impaired persons in our country, similar strides will be made toward aiding and supporting caregivers. I think that's really important um, for caregivers to be to be aware of those um, those statements. All right. So I okay, appreciate that, that, so much. That was that was excellent. Very thorough. Uh, again, uh, this is recorded. Uh, this will be on the cancersurvivorspark.org website as a resource to caregivers. Um, and that's where all those um, references to various places besides uh, here in Greenville, you can go to reach out for help. Um, it, it's interesting, you, you did 27 years of um, uh, clinical uh, so social work uh, and I suspect that most of the time when you had a client or a patient, it was one on one. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have you noticed in the last year that you've been more uh, with the Cancer Institute? I know you're leading a, a support group for caregivers. Um, have you noticed that you have got more than one person in the room more often than you used to? Um. Well, and, and, and I will say that, you know, a lot of my interactions um, are with patients and their family members, caregivers. So um, I think that that does ring true. Um, some of my, you know, interactions with patients are um, virtual or by phone. So it is, you know, a one on one situation. But, um, you know, I do find that you know, oftentimes there are care partners, caregivers who are, you know, with the patients. Yeah, and I would certainly uh, encourage you to, um, for your support group to make sure that they have access to, you know, what you've put together here for this, for this talk. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that obviously will exist in that, in that website format. Um, I always thought in, you know, 40 years of oncology, um, that there were extra uh, anxiety, uh, extra uh, emotional influences that were placed on a family by various caretakers having different opinions mm. about you know how the care should be undertaken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was always the phenomenon of somebody that was not as involved with the family, um, you know, maybe out of whatever emotion, maybe guilt or whatever, uh, that would come in to be, you know, the heroic uh, person. And, and that sometimes would involve, um, you know, not giving up, we're going to go, you know, here, mm -hmm. there and yonder, you know, when it's a situation where, Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's been clear to the people who've been taking care of the patient that it's, you know, maybe time to take care of the patient rather than trying to take care of the disease. Uh, does that does that come up often in your practice as well? I think it does. And, and I think that really speaks to, you know, family dynamics, obviously, and, um, you know, communication. Um, you know, once a diagnosis is made and, you know, the, the best case scenario is that a family does have good lines of communication and they can come together, you know, as a, a unit to support the, the patient and the primary caregiver. Um, but it also speaks to the need for um, perhaps advanced directives um, so that, you know, the patient, um, can make it clear what they, they do or, or do not want or who they would want their healthcare proxy, you know, to be, to make decisions if there is, you know, any, 
um, question as to you know which direction to go. So I think that's an important point. To yeah. Make. And uh, just from the standpoint of emphasizing a, a point that Tanya made, um, and that is, uh, if you're a caregiver, um, there there may be a lot of. I, I really love the um, uh, the caretaker uh, list of things you you uh, you ought to expect. What, what, what's the word? That, that last slide. The, Oh, the yeah, Bill of the Rights. Bill of Here. Rights. The Bill of Rights. Yeah, um, and, and that is, you know, you really have to take care of yourself, even if that means that you um, are, you know, being uh, self-degradating from the standpoint of feeling selfish, or if that's coming from some outside influence. You you have to, if you're going to be any good to the person you're taking care of you just have to take care of yourself. And that means stepping away. And, you know, the park is a great place to do that. Mm -hmm. A movie is, a, you know, just just get away from the experience. But, uh, you know, T Tanya has, has done this now. She's recently been a caregiver. Mm -hmm. She's she's talked about what she did well and what she didn't do well. And one of the things she didn't do well is she kind of fell off the exercise train. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you you really, really have to take care of yourself. I, mean, I um, in talking to her um, in uh, in a previous discussion, I mean, I had a, a patient who was taking care of her son, and um, you know, she recognized that she was having some health issues, but she put them off, put them off, put them off. And right now, the son's fine, but um, she's no longer with us. So it, it's it doesn't have to be that drastic a situation, but. You know, you just have to take care of yourself. Can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. And I think that goes back to that concept of striking balance between your own needs and the needs of the patient and just making sure that that doesn't get, you know, get too far out of balance. Well, again, thank you for your comments. And for those that are uh, on the, uh, the session with us, uh, please, um, uh, talk this up with with friends and family and, and recognize that you can get to these slides and get to the discussion uh, at our website. So um, a couple of uh, quotes that I think are apropos for what we talked about, uh, both from Maya Angelou. Um, you may encounter many defeats, but you not you may you must not be defeated. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats so you can know who you are what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. No matter what happens or how bad it feels today, life does go on and it will be better tomorrow. And then finally, we spend precious hours fearing the inevitable. It would be nice to use that time adoring our families, cherishing our friends and living our lives. So, Thanks for being with us. We will uh, be back next month and um, hopefully you can talk this up and and um, and, uh, and I like this this information because it's really, really important to get disseminated as much as possible. So thank you and good night. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Good night, everybody.